Thank you very much and good morning. I'll give you a brief rundown on insect pest management in canola. So I'll talk about some of the early season pests, our flea beetles and cutworms, and then some of the later season pests, diamondback moth, bertha armyworm, and lagus bug. So let's get started with our number one pest, flea beetle. There's two species that we mainly have in our canola, the striped flea beetle and the crucifer flea beetle, and they're easy to identify with the stripes on the striped species. So the life cycle is one generation per year. They overwinter as adults in the shelter belts and grassy ditches. When the temperatures in the spring warm up to about 59 degrees Fahrenheit air temperature, the adult beetle starts to become active and will emerge. And then the females will eventually go to the newly planted canola fields and lay eggs in the soil close to the germinating canola plants. The eggs hatch in about 12 days and then the larvae will feed on the secondary root hairs for about 25 to 34 days, depending on temperature. And they pass through three different instars or growth stages. Then they'll pupate in the soil for a short period of seven to nine days. And then this is usually July by then. And then we get the next generation of adults that we call the summer generation. And these are the ones that feed on the pods that are maturing and the leaves of canola. They'll also feed on many weed species like wild mustards. In general, the summer generation is not economic, but there has been an economic threshold that has been developed and you need a lot of flea beetles per plant, about 350 to 400 beetles per plant, and that then it would be economic to spray. The most critical stage is the seedling stage in the spring. That is the most susceptible period for the spring flea beetles that are emerging from the overwintering sites. They have chewing mouth parts and they will cause pitting and defoliation in the leaves. And if it's very severe, the infestation, they'll chew the plant right down to the ground. And uh, the canola is generally, once it reaches the six leaf stage, it can tolerate some flea beetle pressure. So we rely heavily on our insecticide seed treatments for management of flea beetles. And our main group has always been the neonicotinoid insecticides group 4A. And we have three different modes of actions that you can see that we have commonly used for the past, oh, almost 20 years now. The diamines, the group 28 is a little bit newer and sirentronilapril is the active ingredient and you probably heard it referred to as lumaderm. And Oftentimes they combine the sirentronilapril with thymethoxin or another neonicotinoid when it's commercially applied. So one of my PhD students, Leslie Lubino, has been looking to see if these insecticide C treatments are still effective against our flea beetles. Because once you use and rely on a certain insecticide for a long time, over a major pest, we can often see the development of insecticide resistance. So we've been looking at this for the last three years and we're gonna do one more year in this year in testing. And we trap the spring flea beetles by using that caramel trap that's handmade over on the right side of the screen. And then we had three sites where we collected flea beetles at the Langdon, Minot, and Dickinson REC. And thanks to uh, Travis Prososka at Minot and Ryan Buteau, Buteau at uh, Dickinson for collecting the flea beetles for us. We tested four treatments, the untreated check, Helix Extra, which is thiamethoxin, Prosper Everglow, which is clothianidid, and Lumaderm, 
sirantranilipril. And all these rates are the standard um, rates that you have on your commercially applied insect seed treatments. So then we tested them in the greenhouse, put the flea beetles in the pots and assessed mortality and feeding injury rating. And here's some results on percent mortality. The different sites are color coded, Dickinson's blue, Langdon's orange, Minot's gray. And the untreated check is always on the right side of the graph. And you can see that we've got fairly good control or percent mortality uh, with the clothianidid and thiamethoxin, the sirantanilopril was a little bit slower in expressing the mortality, but at day seven after uh, planting, the, uh, we did start to see some activity. But all the insecticide seed treatments provided better control, significantly higher percent mortality than the untreated check. And in 2020, we also saw the same trend. All of the insecticide seed treatments were effective against the crucifer flea beetle. And here's the feeding injury rating. The scale is zero to six with six being a dead plant. 2.5 is about the economic threshold in percent defoliation, 25%. And uh, it, then it goes, gets worse as you have a higher number. And as you can see, all of the insecticide seed treatments had significantly lower feeding injury ratings compared to the untreated check. And same trend in 2020. So it's appeared that the uh, seed treatments are working. Um, at Minot, you do see a lower uh, mortality compared to uh, Langdon and Dickinson. Um, and we saw that for both years. And that's part of the reason we're running one more year, 2021 here. It's just to see what's going on there at Minot. And then when we take a look at the difference between the crucifer and striped flea beetle species, you can see that the striped in orange um, had significantly lower percent mortality compared to the crucifer flea beetle in blue. In fact, the striped flea beetle was not significantly different from the untreated check. And if we take a look at the feeding injury rating, you can see the striped flea beetle had significantly higher injury rating. It's actually above the threshold compared to the crucifer flea beetle. And this in 2019, only thiamethoxin was uh, effective or not significant from the untreated check. And we could only get enough striped flea beetles from Langdon to, and 2019 to run the st study. So hopefully we're hoping to get more data this year. So in conclusion, it appears that the crucifer flea beetles being managed fairly good with our current insecticide seed treatments, although we are maybe starting to see an increase in tolerance. The newer mode of action, Sirantranilopril, was a little bit slower to cause mortality, but the beetles did quit feeding after their initial ingestion of the chemical. And striped flea beetles definitely are, have probably resistance or increased tolerance going on as evidenced by the higher mortality and higher feeding injury ratings than the crucifer flea beetles. And this was true for all the insecticide seed treatments that we tested. So moving on to cutworms, that's another early season pest and only a problem when the canola crop is small, it'll either cut the canola or it'll cause defoliation, as you can see in the lower picture. There's some pitting there in the leaves. That's a small cutworm there that's doing that feeding. It's important to get out and scout for cutworms because the insecticide seed treatments do not control them. So you need to use a foliar insecticide, probably a pyrethroid would be best. And you know, if you're at threshold, one or more per three foot of row, need to apply application. 
And it's important to realize the cutworms are active from May to June. There's early season cutworm species, and then there's late season cutworms. Dingy is one that's real common in North Dakota, and that's one that gets going in May through mid-June. And then the redback is a little bit later season cutworm that's fairly common. And that's the dingy cutworm in the picture. Okay, moving on to some mid-season pests, the diamondback moth. It's a small moth, only a half inch wide wingspan and gray to brown. And when the wings are folded, they have a diamond-like pattern or markings. Um, and that's where it got its name, the diamondback moth. The larvae is uh, about a half inch long when mature light to dark green and has a forked posterior end. And when you disturb them, they spin down on a strand of silk from the foliage. And they also will violently thrash back and forth. And you can use that to help identify this critter. Okay, the life cycle, it has uh, multiple generations per year anywhere from 32 days up to go all the way from egg to adult. And these insects migrate into North Dakota on the winds. The insect itself just flutters around when it's out in the field. It's not a particularly strong flyer, but they get sucked up into the upper trajectory winds and they can move a hundred miles or more when they're up in the upper trajectory winds. Um, so they are long distance flyers and they get blown, dropped down wherever that front is. So the female lay eggs on the lower side of the leaves, about 150 eggs per female. They hatch in about five to six days. Then the larvae will go through four different instars in 21 to 30 days and feed on the flowers, the buds, and they will do some feeding on the pods, but they're small, um, so they don't do as much as our earth armyworm that I'll talk about. The pupal stage is five to 15 days. This is a non-feeding stage. It's resting and transforming into the adult moth. Now we have the second generation coming out and the crop is flowering. This is the most susceptible period is during flowering and early pod development. And the cycle will repeat itself. Sometimes they'll get a third generation if it's a very warm uh, summer. So there's two times. The first generation will defoliate the seedling and I've seen them actually consume the whole seedling just like flea beetles. The second generation is feeding on foliage, as you can see in the picture, but also flowers and their buds. And they could move to the uh, pods. Uh, the depends on when they come out um, and when how many were getting blown into the state. You can see the boarded flower there and it's very uh, small and you're not gonna get any seeds from that. So blooming to early pod is very critical. And when you have an infestation of diamondback moth, the crop is very uneven and maturity is often delayed. So it's hard to determine when you're going to swath or harvest. So it moves up into the state. <clears throat> so we use uh, commercially available wing traps and pheromone lures to detect the moths and we put them out from June through July. And if you're seeing more than 100 moths per trap per week, that's a good indication you need to get out and scout the field. That's a lot of moths. And if you're interested in working in insect and trapping, um, go see my NDSU YouTube video that explains how to properly do the insect trapping. So when you go to the field to look for the larvae, you're probably going to see all different life stage. That's because they're constantly being blown into North Dakota and moving around. Um, so you're most likely going to see all the life stages. Remove plants from a square foot and then beat them into a bucket and count the number of larvae that you get off the plants. 
You may see them dangling on strands of silk, so don't forget to count those. And then make sure you count, scout multiple locations, at least five in the field. Thresholds for the seedling stage are 25 to 33% defoliation and larvae present. And then up to the flowering stage, when you have 10 to 15 larvae per square foot. And then after the flowering and potting stage, 20 to larvae per square foot. So moving on to birth the armyworm, uh, we're, this is a large uh, moth. It's a Noctuidae, same as cutworms. Um, it's black with a kidney shaped spot on the forewing. The larvae are small when they hatch, but they get large when they're mature, up to an inch and a half long. There's two different color phases with the species, a black, or a green larvae. And typically during outbreaks, we see more of the black larvae. So there's one generation per year. The moths emerge, usually it's around mid-June. And then the females will lay up to 500 eggs on the lower surface of the canola. And they'll hatch in four to seven days into a larvae that feeds on foliage and pods. And they feed for about six weeks and go through six different instars. And then eventually they'll drop down, it's late summer by now, to the soil to pupate. And then they overwinter as the pupate deep in the soil up to six inches deep. So the damage is caused by the larvae feeding on the foliage and the pods. And it's really when they get to be an inch or larger when they do most of their feeding, they'll consume about 85% of their plant material when they're fairly mature. So I wanna control these when they're small, less than an inch long. So once the canola drops the leaves, then the army worms are forced to move up to the pods for feeding. And this will decrease yield and increase pod shattering and they do continue to feed in the swath uh, once the, when the canola is drying down. So we have pheromone traps that we can use for monitoring. Um, and it's a bucket style trap, a green bucket. And we monitor from mid-June through July. The Canadians have developed guidelines to know whether it's going to be a pest problem or not. If it's zero, to 30 for cumulative trap numbers, you're not at risk, no need to go out and scout. 300 to 900 is uncertain, so you might wanna check just a few fields. 900 to 1200 is moderate, and uh, 1200 and 1500 up is high. Uh, so you definitely scout in the moderate and high level. So when you go out to scout, go out at night because that's when they're actively feeding and you're gonna be, it's easier to see them. And usually you wanna go out too after you know the peak uh, trap catch has occurred and then pull up just like you do for diamond back moth, all the plants in a square foot and then use your white bucket to find them. And remember, if you do not go out during night, you'll wanna make sure to scout and look under leaves and other debris in the field because they're hiding underneath in those debris and stuff. And they are kind of difficult to find. When you disturb them, they often curl up into a little ball. So the threshold that's been developed, it includes a insecticide application and costs. Um, and then the expected market value. Uh, so you can figure out, this is in the fact sheet, but generally most years, the threshold will be 18 to 25 larvae per square yard. And for Ligus bug, mere day, it's a fast moving insect. Um, you're probably not likely to see it um, unless you're using a sweep net. They like to hide um, they're green to brown in color, small, about a quarter of an inch. You can identify them by that triangle in the red circle. 
and the nymph looks just like the adult, but no wings. They have piercing sucking mouth parts and they inject a toxin into the plant when they feed. And this causes the flower buds to abort and the seeds become deformed and shriveled. And it will decrease your seed weight and lower pod development when the populations are economic. The, it's best to get out and scout using a sweep net. This is my colleague, Dr. John Kowalski up in Manitoba. And the thresholds that have been established, the end of petal fall, 15 ligus bugs for 10 sweeps. And after petal fall, 20 per 10 sweep. And I do probably recommend using a pyrethroid insecticide because you need rapid knockdown. And the ligus bugs do move around from alfalfa, sunflower, and other crops. They're attracted to the flowering crops. So here's the foliar insecticides. There's quite a few pyrethroids that are uh, registered. There's the diamines that are registered, the group 28. Uh, Cyrantronilipril uh, is very effective against the lepidopterans, cutworms, diamondback moth, earth armyworm, flea beetle, and blister beetle. The chlorantronilipril is very effective against diamondback moth, crevathon, and this one is also safer for bees. Uh, neonicotinoids uh, transform, we have that's for soybean aphids, and it's uh, effective uh, only for aphids. There is one microbial, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt. It's the same Bt that's in your corn for corn rootworm and European corn borer. And it's effective but you, against the birth of armyworm and diamondback moth, but you need to get the application on early because it only controls the early instars. And then there's a premix, which is two modes of action, besiege, and it controls most of our insect pest in canola. So again, I served on the US canola uh, committee to form the best, best, best management practices for pollinator protection in canola fields. It's online if you wanna read the document on the Honey Bee Health Coalition site, but during flowering, the canola is very attractive. It's highly nutritious for pollinators and they just love canola. So you, if it's flowering and you need to spray that insecticide, you definitely need to go in the late evening or early morning. We do have the North Dakota honeybee map that's available on the North Dakota Department of Agriculture website. You know, check it out and contact your local beekeepers, communicate. They may wanna move their beehives if you're going to spray. Um, avoid insecticide drift to non-target areas and use a less toxic pesticide. I did mention Prevathon. So very important in canola. So unfortunately we don't have a lot of the moths later in the season. And here's some other resources that are available to you on the three pests that I talked about. And thanks very much for your attention. And I don't know if there's time for um, some questions, but I'll be happy yeah. to take them.